Um, we have been covering a lot of things. I was, I'll just repeat very quickly for those that have not been here. Um, we are going to be talking about servant leadership. We're going to end with the three tables that Jesus sets for us. But we just reviewed briefly that um, there is one more table that was not set, but instead was turned over. Jesus turned that over because it was a table of unrighteousness. It was a table that um, was not glorifying to God because it was the, the merchants in the temple that was supposed to be a house of prayer. And so everything we've been talking about the last couple of weeks as far as cleansing our hearts, cleansing our tongues, our mouths, all of that is about turning over this table of unrighteousness that we want to cleanse out that which is not pleasing to the Lord. And so keep that table in mind because the tables that we're setting tonight are quite different. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with John. If you want to follow along in scripture, we got a lot tonight. John 13, 2 through 17. It says, the evening meal was being served and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? As in, no, please don't. Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Okay, I'm going to stop right there, actually. Um, I do want to jump on down to verse 13, if you're following. It says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Now, y'all might think that I planned this series to hit on this night because we're a night before at being in Holy Week, normally we celebrate on Thursday night, Maundy Thursday, which is where Jesus did wash the disciples' feet, okay? I did not plan it this way. It just fell this way, which I take as God wanting to deliver a message in a timely way at, a t at an appropriate time for such a time as this. So when I say this, when Jesus washes the the disciples' feet, what is he demonstrating to them? Servant leadership, yes. Okay, and how so? Why is this so important to him? He's going to, that's what you're saying. He, he's not going to ask them to do what he wouldn't have done. Exactly. Okay, so from there, we're going to go into several scriptures that point to us as leaders in the church and people in the body and why, how this plays out and how we relate to one another, how we relate to God, and how this servant leadership looks, the servant heart, how that should look in various elements. Now, usually when we talk about servant leadership, what's the key um, thing behind servant leadership, the key characteristic? Humility. humility, yes. Okay, so we're looking at First of all, the humility of Christ. How did Christ humiliate himself? Not humiliate, but humble himself. Humble himself. Um, I corrected that quickly. Okay. How did he humble himself? That's not right. Empty his Godhead, come here as a man. Yes. Emptied his divinity, you might say. We'll, we'll shorten it that way. Okay, in other words, he laid down his Godhead, his, his divine person in order to become man, right? Yeah. To become just like us. Why was that important? To show us, to show that we could also be probably sinless if we try. We can try to be sinless like him. He was sinless. He was perfected already. 
But what happens when we look at his example? We fall short, right? But he is showing us what it should look like, even as humans, that he is going through everything we've gone through. In other words, he's experiencing everything that we experience. He experienced every temptation that we do. He experienced the hardships of life, the suffering of life. So his experiences are like ours. Who are we going to identify more with, with the Godhead or with the man? Of course, the man. So we're experiencing his humanness. Now, his humanness is obviously, again, perfected. But what should that do? It challenges us or encourages us, depending on how you look at it, to be like him. All right? Which means we should be willing also to humble ourselves. Now, that seems contradictory to what the world would say is a leadership characteristic, right? As leaders in the world, we have to be strong, we have to be talented, we have to be almost arrogant at times, self-selling, selling ourselves, tough, assertive, all these good things, right, that we learned in corporate world as leaders do. Those still can fit into the church leadership, but only in the sense that we take all of that and bring them under the Holy Spirit and allow him to use those characteristics with this foundation of humility, okay? So we're going to talk about how that looks tonight because to be a servant in the church is one thing. We're all supposed to be servants in the church, but to be a servant leader has more than one facet, okay? It's a little bit different, and so we want to talk about all the different facets of that tonight as best we can. That being said, Patrick, go ahead and read Philippians 2, verse 1 through 8, if you want to follow. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you, not, uh, let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, But emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Amen. Okay, so for those of you who are paying attention, what jumps at you from that passage? Death on a cross. What does that say about Jesus' example? Extreme. I like that. Extreme, it's sacrificial. Extreme, I love, that's good. I didn't even have that one. Okay, um, what else? Anything? He put a lot aside to do what he was called to do. Okay, so laying down self. Yes, that's it. Puts others' needs in front of his own. Okay, and that's what he's calling us. Go back to verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Well, isn't that what we do in corporate world? Makes sense that we would do that as leaderships in church, right? That we would come, like clamor for position or clamor for title. No, no. (laughs) <laughs> not in church settings. We don't want to do that, even though we're given titles, and those titles mean something in the hierarchy of the body. It should not be what we are after. It should not be our pursuit to, to strive for those things or compete for those things. He's knocking out competition right here. 
okay? I've never been in a church setting, honestly, where there's not some competition among people. But it is not godly in the sense. It's one thing to be competitive in sports. I'm, that's godly, okay? That's expected. I guess it's godly. It's not, you know, <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with the church functioning. But in churches, we are not about being competitive. We're about being what God calls us to be, and that's to be like Christ. So do nothing out of selfish ambition, nothing out of vain conceit. Now, what would vain conceit look like in a church? It's all about love. Look at me. I'm up front. I got this position. I look good. I got to be perfect. Nobody thinks I do anything wrong. I'm never going to admit I do anything wrong. We all got that going on that we're just perfect, right? No, hopefully not, okay? Um, but in humility, consider what? Others. Others better than yourself. Oh, wait a minute. If I'm a leader, shouldn't I be better than the one that's not a leader? Yeah? Behave better. I should behave better. Yeah, that's a good point. But does that mean I'm a better person? Yeah. No. It means that God has put me in a position based on what I have to offer that he has given me to offer. But it does not mean that I'm better than anybody else, no matter where they are in their faith walk, no matter how mature or immature. We should not be holding that over them going, hey, you need to be like me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> please no. All right. <laughs> um, each of you should look not only for your own interest. How many in church, especially as we move into staffing and elders and leadership, want to serve our own interest? I don't want to do it your way. And I don't want to do the music you like. I want to do my way. I want to do what pleases me. I want to do what I like. That's what we call consumer Christianity, right? Where we're coming to receive something that we like, that we're getting something out of it, instead of saying, what am I bringing to it? What am I bringing to this body or to this situation or this worship or whatever it is that is beneficial to the whole more so than me, myself, and I, okay? Um, so you want to look out for the interest of others. That means at times we have to be in that attitude of being sacrificial. We have to go, you know what, the fact that you're tired and I'm tired, okay, that means we should both go sit down, right, tell somebody else to do it. No, it means I will say, you go sit, I'll do it. Or she might say, you know what, Berta, you go sit, I'll take care of that. Okay, that's the mentality that we should have. And so I see as leaders, um, you do see that happen a good bit in this church, but I would not say we have it perfected. Okay, Jesus laid down his very life, everything that he was, everything that he is for others, taking the very nature of a servant. Okay, in fact, the very nature of the likeness of a slave, which is even lower than a servant. Okay, we start out basically as slaves to sin, then we become slaves to the cross, but God elevates us to servanthood and ultimately to what? Priesthood, to the family of God, heirs in the kingdom. Okay, so as we humble ourselves before God, he starts to lift us up. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. I told you everything I'm teaching you is going to be backed up with scripture somewhere. <clears throat> okay, verse 4, we're going to read 7 through 11. It says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled. That goes back to the weeks before. Uh, clear-minded, self-controlled, so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another, Without grumbling. Well, who had to put that phrase in? Uh -huh. <laughs> Don't most of us want to grumble about what we're having to do, especially when we're tired or somebody else should be doing it? Okay, we're going to talk about that. When somebody else should be doing it and when they shouldn't. We're going to get there. 
Okay, the other thing he says, verse 10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Now, one more time, jump over with me. Should be on the same page roughly. Chapter 5, verse 1 same book. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be. Not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. That's a tough passage. What's tough about it to you? Got to take the ego out of it. Yes. Okay. Some of us are given, well, all of us are given gifts by the Holy Spirit to serve the body, to serve the church to serve his kingdom. Some gifts are considered more powerful than others. Some gifts may not be as noticeable or as forefront as others, but it does not mean they have any less value. So as a leader, whether you're a servant, whether your gift is hospitality, whether your gift is administration or leadership or prophecy or teaching or whatever it might be, In God's eyes, all he's asking is that you use the gift that he gave you for the benefit of the body and for his glory, okay? So it doesn't matter that Debbie's an evangelist, that I would love to be like her. I am not that evangelist. Does that mean she's better than me? Does God love her anymore? No. Do I stand in awe of her gifting sometimes? Yes. And that's okay, It's okay to be in awe of what God has empowered somebody to do and even to maybe aspire to that yourself and pray for that gift, but it should never become a thing of jealousy or competition, okay? And just like, you know, one of my gifts is the teaching and I love teaching. I find great passion in it. And at the same time, I don't expect everybody in the room to be a teacher because we're not geared that way. So take the gift that God has given you and serve with that gift until he decides he wants to change it or add to it and do it unto his glory for the benefit of the body. That's a servant heart right there. That is being a good steward of what God has given us. This is an important, these two passages are very important as leadership because it establishes the roles of the leader in very general terms, but also the terms of Christ-likeness, which is the most important of all. Um, Let me use a dark color here. Um, in In the chapter four passage, who are we imitating? We've already said serving like Christ, right? Which means humbly, sacrificially. Okay? That's, that's your starting point. That should be our starting point anytime we accept a role as a leader. And that's again, sounds contrary to what you may have learned in the real world, what we call the corporate world or, you know, the world according to anybody but Christ. Um, we want to start here. But now look at chapter 5 again. He says, you are like shepherds and overseers. What's the difference? What does a shepherd do? Protects, guides, cares for the flock. Yes. Okay. Now. What about overseers? What's different? 
What do they do? Supervise, good. What? They, they give instruction. Give instruction, good. What else? Yeah. yeah. Well, technically, overseer can be because you've got leadership as a gift and administration as a gift, things like that that come into leadership or into being an overseer. Um, overseer would that count into holding accountable people? Yes, accountable. Okay. Yeah, that goes back to the supervision, the performing the job properly, making sure things are done correctly. Basically, what they do is provide guidance, leadership, yes. And all these things that y'all just said, supervision, instruction, accountability. Um, now, what, what does the shepherd have to be, what does he have to do in order to do this? In order to protect and guide his sheep, he has to have sheep, okay? Yeah, if nobody's following you, you're probably not a leader, okay? <laughs> so, so, you're a leader of self, okay? Um, <laughs> all right, so we need sheep, Debbie said. Um, what else? What does a shepherd carry with him? A staff. A staff for what purpose? Wrangle them in. Wrangle them in. That's right. Yes. Okay, so we need a staff to steer, <laughs> and we need a rod to beat the wolves. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mine too. Uh, all right, so a shepherd is not going to be effective if he doesn't have his tools with him, right? Most of all, he has to have eyes to see. He has to be alert, okay? If you look at your outline, the first line on there is be what? Be alert. Alert and aware, okay? The overseer has to be aware of what is required, what is needed, what is missing, what needs to be done, who can do it, what people's giftings are. You see the difference? Okay, this one's alert to protect. This one's aware in order to assemble and orchestrate yes okay does that make sense does that help anything maybe <laughs> so, all right so so far we haven't really talked a whole lot about service but if you think about a shepherd who is the shepherd in the kingdom of god on earth as you read old and new testament were shepherds considered the elite of the of the the workers Lowly shepherds, dirty, stinky shepherds, okay? So it's not about position for them, is it? All right, so we definitely have the humility thing going. Now, what about overseers? Who can you think of in, in the scriptures that were overseers? Whoops. Kings, good. Pharisees, yeah. Okay, so how do we... Decide which kind of overseer we're going to be. Do what? We have to listen to the Holy Spirit, yes. To be the right type of overseer. I just lost my mic. <laughs> Somewhere, excuse me. Um, <laughs> I'll turn around for this. To be the overseers. <laughs> Please. <laughs> um, we want to make sure that as overseers that we are following Christ's likeness in his character, in his nature, in his mercy, in his generosity, in his graciousness, all these characteristics of him that do not compare to the overseers that we know as the Pharisees, right? Right? So, how are we going to do that? We're going to talk about that here in Ephesians 6, verse 7. 
Y'all don't notice, but you're also getting your Bible training as we flip, okay? <laughs> Start learning where things are. Chapter 6, verse 7 of Ephesians, it says, Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. Okay, again, he's saying this is not about position. Your rewards are based on what? Heart. What? Your heart. Your heart and how you serve, the heart with which you serve. So now we're talking about the difference between a godly overseer and a Pharisee overseer is all about the heart, the motive, the intentions, right? If you are a godlike overseer, then we're going to serve again with that humility. We're going to be looking at what is good for the people, not what's good for me. Because the Pharisees did write the opposite. In fact, they were all about them, all about their reputation, all about what man saw in them, about their position. They would lay heavy burdens of the law on the people and yet not lift a finger themselves to do anything, right? So we want to be opposite of that opposite all right we want to give our whole heart which means that we're not just showing up when it's convenient right if you're wholehearted what characteristics come from that first and foremost yes sacrificial it's not always about how you feel or whether it's convenient so we're going to put non-convenient. Most of the time it is non-convenient. Okay. <laughs> it's a lot more convenient to sit home on your sofa and watch TV, right? Especially if you worked all day. Hey, good to see you. Um, all right. So the servant overseer, the Christ-like overseer, is sacrificial, not worried about convenience. What else? Always gives 110%. 110%. You go, girl. All right, 110%, maybe even 150, okay? Now, I had a boss like that in the corporate world. He said 100% was not good enough, and... That's why Shep doesn't work there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I worked until I was pooped, but you know what? I'm more pooped here than I was there, um, because here... There's not a line. We have to form boundaries with people, and we could do a whole lesson on boundaries, but um, we are supposed to give more than what we're capable of in our own power. That's what it boils down to, is we are supposed to be walking in the power of God, dependent upon God, so that he strengthens us, he empowers us, he will allow us to get up and do things that we could not do on our own. In fact, to be honest, I pray every morning, Lord, Without you, I'm nothing, but I'll do whatever you empower me to do. And by the end of the day, I can click off, okay, we got this done, we got that done, thank you, Lord. Okay, so sometimes it's, you know, hopefully at least 100%. And sometimes it may look or feel more like 150%. But guess what? When you gave 150%, where did the rest of it come from? God. In fact, if we really check it out, it might be that he gave us the 100% and we only did 50%. All we got to do is show up, be obedient, be willing, and go, I am yours. I will do whatever you would have me do. Not, hey, my title says I only do this. <laughs> okay? I'm an associate pastor. I don't have to do anything but teach, maybe counsel a little bit. I'm retired even. So, you know, Lord, really, I only need to do 25%. I need to fall on my face. Uh, you know, as a retiree, maybe 25%, God. What do you think God says to that? You don't retire. You almost fell on your face. That's right. <laughs> I will let you fall on your face <laughs> if you try to do 25%. Um, exactly. Good point. Where would we be, Craig said, if he only gave 25% on the cross? Unforgiven. That's right. And here's the deal. In the ministry of God and elders, I'm sorry, but you're also ministers of God.
There is no retirement. You can retire from a job that pays you, but you cannot retire from the call of God until you fall on your face dead. <laughs> okay, so, um, and even then, typically, it's working, it's well, then you're going to be in heaven working it, serving. Okay, <laughs> so, um, so keep in mind that as overseers and as shepherds, it's 150 percent. Let's say. Um, and it really comes down to just being available, being uh, dependent upon God, and then being obedient to whatever God tells you to do that day. And that can be anything from scrubbing toilets to evangelizing to washing dishes to teaching. I mean, we can go all across the spectrum here. As leaders, you're called to do it all. Why? Because not everybody will. And that gets us to our next point. What? Because you can. Because I can, yes. And because we can, we should, at least to some degree. We're going to talk about the buts in there, the ifs, ands, and buts of that. All right? So we're going to have this humble, obedient attitude of Christ. Now, go to Romans 12, 3, 5, Berta. 3 through 5. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we though many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Okay. Well, what does that just tell us? Get over yourself. I love it. That's exactly what I wrote on my notes. Okay. <laughs> get over yourself. If you get nothing else out of tonight, get this. <laughs> When you're saying, it's not my job, get over yourself. When you're saying, I'm too tired, get over yourself. But I'm tired. I don't care. <laughs> so, I do care. I really do. I understand it. But the point being is if God's telling you to do it, he knows what you're capable of. Even though you may think you're not, you may think you're too tired, he's going, I will empower you. I will help you. Okay, and if you ever have God tell you to get over yourself, you won't forget it. Been there, done that. Or him go, who do you think you're talking to? When you're making up excuses or complaints, you won't forget that either. Um, get over yourself. All right, so if we get over ourselves, it means that we're going to take on this attitude of Christ which even he did not think more highly of himself than he ought. What did he say? He is a humble servant. He does not consider equality with God, the Father, to be something he can achieve here on earth. Okay? So if he can't, how are we going to? We are not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought. How many of you ever had that experience where you're going, yeah, well... I'm better than Elizabeth, you know. I mean, good grief. How much Bible training has she been through? It's fair. It's not fair. <laughs> because it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with that God has appointed you and called you and said, Elizabeth, you have a purpose in my kingdom and I'm going to gift you according to that purpose and you're going to do great things for the kingdom of God because I said so. And we don't care what Sherilyn thinks. Actually, I wanted her in, okay. <laughs> That's why I pick on her. She knows I don't believe that. Um, it doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what somebody else thinks about us. It matters what God says. And so you don't need to, get, you not only need to get over yourself, you got to get over what other people think about you or don't think about you, okay? None of us are higher than the other 
in the perspective of God. We are all sinners, all redeemed by Jesus, the blood of Christ, transformed by the Holy Spirit, each in our own time according to the conviction brought upon us in the Holy Spirit. So none of us can compare with each other because my journey is different from Ryan's journey that's different from Patrick's journey and God's timing is perfect in each person. Even though somebody else may be moving faster than us or perceptibly slower than us, it does not matter. So what Craig thinks about Elizabeth, we don't care. We don't care, right? <laughs> He's agreeing, okay? <laughs> so, um, and I'm using these people because, like I said, they're good-natured and they don't care if I pick on them. But all of this goes back to that place of humility, back to the humility, back to the attitude of Christ. Now, this last point, we're going to spend a good bit of time. Turn with me to Matthew 20, verses 25. No, let's go ahead and do 20 through 28. Um, 20 through 28. Now, if I don't think of myself more highly than I ought, and somebody says, hey, Sherilyn, there's bugs on the floor, there's coffee spilled down at the end of the hall, what should I do? Go what? Go fix it, okay? What if I'm about to start my Sunday school class and I've got to teach and I can't get to it because I've got to start going in there to teach? Find someone who can, Find someone who can right? Okay, this is where as leaders, servant leaders, things get a little wonky sometimes because invariably, we did a series a while back and I did a second series on messy church and in messy church, people don't do what they're supposed to do. They just don't, none of us, okay? We might do part of what we're supposed to do, but we don't do everything that we're supposed to do. And so when somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to do, let's say that I'll pick on Avery. Let's say Avery was supposed to mop the floor. And Avery was tired that night. He had a sore throat. Didn't feel good. So he didn't mop. Now, Sunday morning shows up, and I've got bugs on the floor and coffee spills on the floor, and I'm trying to get to Sunday school, and Avery didn't mop, and I can't find anybody to go clean it up. What have I got to do? I got to go clean it up. This is called picking up his towel. He dropped the ball or the towel, as the case may be, the towel of service like Jesus carried. Okay, so now I got to pick up his towel. Now, how am I supposed to respond to that? Yes. Just do it. Nike. <laughs> Both are true. Okay, first of all, I got to just do it. Okay, I got to pick up his towel. Now, should I be grumbling and griping to everybody in the hallway as I pick up that towel? No. No, no I really shouldn't. I should just graciously go pick it up. Class, I'll be there in a minute, okay? But what do I do with Avery? Correct him privately. Privately. And I don't even have to correct him necessarily. If, he, if he's receptive, I can go to him and say, but I noticed that something was missed in the hallway this morning that you didn't get. So um, I had to clean it up. So I didn't know if that was an oversight, but could you catch that next time? Because I really don't have time on Sunday morning to do that. Now, if he is the kind of leader he's supposed to be, all right, what would he say? Thank you for pointing that out. I'm sorry, whatever it might be. I will, I will do better. I'll take care of it, okay? That's how we should be responding to those situations. Now, if I don't go to him, and yet I'm behind the scenes going, Avery did not clean up that hallway. He never gets all that clean. I don't know why he can't just get that on Wednesday night before we... Yeah, I mean, you're laughing because it's true, right? Yeah, this is how human nature works. But again, we're not called to be human anymore. We're called to be Christ-like. And so in Christ-likeness, I keep my mouth shut. I clean up his mess and I say what? Unto you, O Lord, I do this. I'm not doing it for Avery. I might be doing it for the church so somebody doesn't slip and fall down. 
But ultimately, I'm doing it unto Christ. I'm saying, Lord, I do this joyfully unto you. That's what we should be saying. And then I can choose to let it go and just see if he does it again. But if it becomes a pattern, then I need to go to him and correct. That's the other part of the leadership, the accountability overseer part. So the shepherd's going to clean it up in order to protect the church, right? But the overseer's going to go and try to correct. But gently, kindly, nicely, at least the first five times. Okay. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Avery, for letting me make you look bad. In the fact that you have faith that if he had to do it for you, like if something happened and you couldn't mock, he would do it for you. Yes, the mindset, if we follow scripture, is that each of us are looking out for the others more than ourselves. So whomever is in that situation would go, I will take care of it. Unto the Lord, joyfully, without anger or griping or complaining. And if it's a pattern and he's not doing a job that he's been assigned to do, which he hasn't, by the way, but if he had, that I would go, Avery, I need you to step up here. Okay. So, but do I have the authority as, I'm not his boss. I can't go, Avery, step up. You're not getting your job done. Okay. There's very few of us in the church that have that kind of authority. We have the authority of Christ that is a, an authority that is built in graciousness and mercy and truth and love. Okay, so I want to be gentle and kind as much as possible. Okay, all this being said, now we're going to go to 20, chapter 20 of Matthew. I'm just going to read this whole section here. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last, hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, friend, I'm not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. What's the message in this parable? Everybody's equal. Everybody gets the same what? Treatment. The what? The same reward. And what is our reward in Christ Jesus? Heaven. Heaven. Salvation. So it doesn't matter whether somebody comes in the last hour or the first hour, anywhere in between. We all get the same salvation, right? Is that wrong? No. no. Is it fair? Yes. No. Maybe not. Does it matter? No. 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 Why? We're not, <laughs> We're not in charge. Who's in charge? Yes. He is. God is, yes. And in the grand scheme of things, have we lost anything? No. 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 We didn't earn our way into heaven, did we? No. It was a gift. And God gave me the same gift as he gave you, and we all benefit from that gift, okay? So you can't earn it, and if you can't earn it, you can't lose it. It's a gift, and we need to receive that with thanksgiving regardless of how anybody else is treated. Okay, now... He goes on in, 
Let's see, where was I going? Down to 25. Go down to 25. I'm sorry. Go down to verse 20 of 20. That's where we're supposed to start. I started ahead because I wanted to make that point. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down asked a favor of him. Now, who are the sons of Zebedee? James and John, yes, the sons of thunder. What is it you want, he asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? <coughs> we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. Again, he's deferring to the authority of his father in heaven. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Why were they indignant? They were trying to get ahead. Yeah. yeah, because they're thinking highly of themselves. They want a special position like they've done something different from all the other disciples and they're going, wait, bud. You know, we've all been in this together, right? <laughs> so, uh, so they're indignant at this. Jesus, in verse 25, says, Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Now, I think we've made it pretty clear what Jesus' purpose was in serving as man, right? What was that purpose? To give his life, to forgive our sins. He could have done that without becoming a man. He was here to teach us. He was here to be an example you as leaders in this church are also here to be an example to people in the body who may not understand the leadership role except from maybe a worldly or corporate perspective. So when you treat them with humility and kindness and deferring off of self to, and, and deferring to them, what are they going to see? Something different, right? Something unique. Something that makes them go, wow, why are they so humble? Why are they so kind? Why are they not talking down to me? Why are they not being hateful to me in their correction? Why? Because we're demonstrating Christ if we're doing what we're supposed to do. Now, that being said, if you look at Matthew 23, verse 12, just go over a couple pages. In 23, let me find it. I lost it. Sorry. 23 verse 12. He says, For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Okay? As leaders, we are not supposed to be up here beating our chest going, I'm in charge. Okay? It's not what we're about. That's not at all what we're about. Most of you thankfully, are so humble that you don't even want to come do your, you know, your offering, you know, <laughs> to do the little offering moment on Sunday mornings because you're like, I don't want to, okay? And I appreciate the humility, but then I have to go back to what we had up here early to get over yourself, okay? Because it's not about you, and it's not about what anybody thinks about you, and it's not even about me fussing at you or Donnie fussing at you or the other elders fussing at you or making fun of you, Right? It's about what? Serving. serving the Lord. You are working and serving for an audience of one. What everybody else thinks is irrelevant if your heavenly father is pleased with you. And that's what you have to keep in mind in order to get over yourself, okay? Um, now, it goes on to say, this is where it gets a little tricky. For those of you that want to follow, go to Acts 6. This is going to be our last passage. And I'm going to finish on time, I think. 
Okay, Acts 6, verse 2. It says, So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. Okay, did we not just say that if God says mop a floor or scrub a toilet, that that's your role as a leader, a servant leader? Mm -hmm. But what does this say? Yes. And this is where when you hear Donnie say it's different, servant leadership is different for leaders, okay, for the elders and the pastors and the teachers and whatever. This is what he's referring to, I'm pretty sure, because what's more important, the floor being mopped or sharing the word? word. Of course, sharing the word. Why? That's going to set you free, not mopping. That's right. This. Okay. So, therefore, Debbie never has to wash another dish, right? Souls, S O L E S. It's supposed to be S O U L S. I'll get it right in a minute. <laughs> All right, so we're winning uh, Souls of Shoes and Souls, you know. Yeah, he was right. It was Souls of Shoes. But um, we're winning souls for the kingdom and wearing out our souls, right? <laughs> With feet that are fitted for the gospel of peace. Now, <laughs> feet that are washed by servant leaders yes perfect okay washed <laughs> Oop, washed <laughs> washed <laughs> by servant leaders so all of those things are true at the same time all right so we just have to make sure, not that we're saying, no, I can't wash the dishes or I can't mop the floor or scrub the toilet, but we're saying, if I do that, I got to make sure that it's not interfering with my ultimate call or ultimate giftings, which is to share the word and win the souls into the kingdom, okay? But if we're honest with ourselves, we're not winning souls 24-7, are we? If we were, our churches couldn't hold everybody. So... If I'm here on a Wednesday night and everybody's gone home, I'm not sharing the word and I'm not going to win a soul. So if the floor needs mopping, don't let Elizabeth do it. <laughs> That's a whole nother story. Um, uh, <laughs> don't ask Debbie to do it because she hates to mop. But you know who I've seen do it? Donnie. In fact, the, the story was that there was a, a mop sink left on in the kitchen by a certain someone that shall remain nameless, <coughs> Elizabeth. And uh, <laughs> the floor got flooded. Avery found it. He's trying to take out the trash. He's trying to handle everything. He calls his dad and says, hey, can you come help me? Donnie goes running from whatever we were doing at the time. And I'm headed out the door, but I turn around and call, and I'm like, what's going on? Is something wrong? I thought somebody died. And come to find out, the kitchen was flooded. So I turn around, came back, and helped mop up the floor. And it was all good, except that Donnie told her she could never mop again. <laughs> so if you don't want to do any work, okay, just make a mess. No. <laughs> do what? Make a big mess, yeah. Um, what you're saying is our priority should be sharing the word. Yes, our priority is the word. But our responsibility as shepherds is that we take care of the flock, everybody in the flock, as well as share the word, and we take care of God's house, okay? Because God's house is where the tables are set, and you as leaders are called to set those tables 
with Christ. So that takes me to my last thing. It won't take but a minute. Okay, when we look at Psalm 23, okay, what's the first line of Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He restores still waters. Keep going. Okay, what does he do? He prepares a table. Yes, a table before me. And what is this table about? What happens at this table? He anoints my head with oil. What does that mean? Anoints. The first table is that God anoints by the table that our great shepherd has set for us, this table was set by Christ that we would benefit, that we're taken care of, we're anointed for what purpose? His purposes, his glory, right? So that's table number one. Everybody understand that one? Okay, this one God gave me today, so I got excited about it because I never thought about it. All right, the second table that we see is the Lord's Supper. Who set that table? Mm. It was set for Christ, but who set it? Disciples. He sent out the disciples to go get the stuff to set the table. So this one was done by the disciples... For whom? For Jesus. So in the anointing that he's already given them, they are now doing what? Serving Serving him. Yes. And what does this table represent? Yes. The table of sacrifice. So that he not only sacrifices himself, but he causes us to sacrifice with him. To remember the covenant, remember the brokenness, remember everything that he suffered so that we will embrace it and go with him in the same suffering, the same sacrifice. We don't think about that a whole lot. We think about remembering what he did, and that's good, that's why he did it. But it's also so that we remember that this is also what we're embracing. It's what we're to be doing as well. So it's remembering him and us in relationship, in covenant together. Agree? Disagree? Okay. Then let's look at table number three. Where's table number three? The what? After he rises, who said somebody else said it? The great banquet table in heaven. You're all right. (laughs) And what is that table about? He set the table. Okay. Jesus set the table. That's it. Okay. We invite the guest and then we all enjoy and celebrate the promise fulfilled. So when he set the table of sacrifice, he promised the table to come, right? And now we see that promise fulfilled. So, I thought this was very apropos in in this fact that this is Holy Week, that we see these three tables that are set before us from beginning to end, what he's called us to do, what he's called us to be in relationship, in covenant with him. Now, 
As I mentioned earlier, there is that one more table, and that one more table is that table of unrighteousness that we have to turn over, repent, change, get rid of every day so that we stay cleansed and able to embrace the gifts and the power of the other three tables. So, which table would you rather be at? Number three? Okay. So remember number two and be grateful for number one. And use what's been given you and the anointing. Respect the overturned one, one, yes. Okay? It's eight o'clock. I'm finished. Ha! (laughs) Uh, Let's close in prayer unless anybody else has a comment, argument, debate, whatever. Question. Good deal. All right. Father, we do just thank you for your word and the power of your word, Father God, and how it just challenges us to be so many things in your kingdom. But Father, most of all, it challenges us to be like Christ. And if we're like him, we don't have to worry about all the little details, Father God, as much. And so we ask, Lord, that as you turn the tables over in our worldliness, our fleshiness, Father God, as you cleanse us and uh, make us ready vessels, Father, that you will bring forth that table, that anointing, Father God, that empowers us to serve you and set the table before you and before others to come into your kingdom. Father, let us be worthy of the calling that is bef- that is upon us, Father, that we would be humble in our service. And Father, yet we would be powerful and diligent as we stay alert and aware of the needs of the church, the needs of our people, our sheep, our our body, and Father, the needs of the building as well. But Father, more importantly, the needs of the lost souls in your kingdom that need to know this beautiful relationship that we have in Jesus Christ. So let us be as those humble servants, also faithful and empowered, anointed, Father, to go forth and declare your gospel, to be those living examples to others as Jesus was to us. And Father, let us be those servant leaders whom you are proud to call your children and Father, whom you have empowered for your glory. And Father, we do pray that everything that we do in our leadership would be for your glory. We ask you, Lord, to be with us now, to go with us, to guide us, to correct us, to beat the wolves back from us, Father God, and just to um, allow us to grow in Christ-likeness each and every day so that we can accomplish that which we were set forth to accomplish. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Y'all go home. Good job. Thank you.